Richard Howe um, talking. We got, like I said, we only got a minute and a half into it, so um, we'll sort of overlap to get his point here and then mm. move on in the discussion. So here we go. Here is Dr. Richard Howe. We'll be nicer to him than we are Rustine, by the way. <laughs> yeah. the existence of God before you can get specific evidence and arguments for the truth of the Christian faith. The reason that is in our mind is because arguments for the truth of Christianity in particular among competing theisms in the world is it will be an appeal, among other things, to historical miracles, not the least of which is the resurrection of Jesus. But- and so, yeah, so just to kind of uh, reiterate on that, um, there's competing theisms. And so we're going to do apologetics and relativism, which I find. So, yeah, that's, mm-hmm. a, that's where I find a problem. Like we're going to live in a we're going to allow a relevant relativistic reality. And we're going to argue our relativism with their relativism. And so I've, I've gotten this uh, into this with, with a, an internet buddy of mine. Um, and he's just like, you know, you're being subjective. And I'm like, well, in your worldview, I'm being subjective. You're being subjective. Where's the standard? That's right. You have to and have so, some type of an yeah. ultimate authority. And that becomes the real problem for me. And, I, and again, my issue would be the appeal to reason is not a objective standard. And by that, I mean this, we might say, oh, look, our connection point, and this is my problem with classical apologetics. And again, if I've been wrong, I'm always, I'm teachable, ready to learn always. But if my appeal, and from what I get to there is, well, we're going to appeal to their reason to bring a generalized theism and acceptance of God to their mind first. Yeah. So here's the problem. Number one, we do not have reason as a universal. People reason differently. People, there are some people that think it is perfectly reasonable to kill babies in the womb. There are people who think it is perfectly reasonable to steal. Yeah, and so you get into those underlying per, uh, you know, presuppositions on, well, if we are all molecules in motion, everything is permissible. Why should I care about you? Bingo. You know, and so whenever you're reasoning with something like that, yeah, you can you can be like, well, don't you feel that that's wrong? It's like, well, now are you if you're going to use logic, sh- should I feel? Should that's a pathetic fallacy, by the way, on that. And so you know, you can appeal to these people, but then you're again, you're going to end up going down their road if you get them on your road via this. It's only going to be because of the Holy Spirit, an, but it doesn't make your position right. So an ultimate authority is a position a foundation that you do not stand you you can't get behind you are on top of it this also speaks into the idea of um just he says like on just the the little bit of inerrancy that we talked about he said that you know he and he said it in other places too that we get our hermeneutics from Mm, reality yes yes yes. we get our hermeneutics from reality well in this sense um okay so the reality is and he would admit is that every fact is a fact because God made it. Right? Yes, agreed. I think that fact, they'd be right on right? On, on with that. Yeah, so 100%. They, so they get they get everything from that reality. But then he's going, but there is competing theism, right? Is there? Is that reality? No, it is not reality. So now you are stuck in a dilemma because you're saying we get everything from reality, yet you say competing the- theisms are a reality. But it's not really reality. So then my, my, <laughs> yeah. my issue, and I yeah. gosh, we, we played like 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're, we're kind of unloading after that. Yeah. And then and yeah. the, none of that is to misrepresent no. or to belittle no. by any means. I want to make sure that that's very clear. So I want to jump back to this problem. As a presuppositional covenantal apologist, our goal and I don't think this has got represented really well. 
and I and I hope if we get another discussion that we get to put this forward, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Hal, he, he had listened to all of our other shows, which was quite a privilege, yeah. by the way. Thank you. That was an honor. And, and man, we're so grateful uh, Mr. Tucker watched last time. Very thankful for him. Like, feel privileged that he wrote a blog about us, and we'll try to respond. Uh, what you do in a covenantal apologetic is you stand on their foundation, and you demonstrate its inconsistency, its arbitrariness, and its inability to provide for the preconditions of intelligibility. Because reason alone cannot do that, the position is seen as utter foolishness, deconstructed. It's the quicksand quotient, as Dr. Oliphant would put it. Yeah. But miracles are only possible if there is a God who exists. So if if a naturalist or an atheist is consistent with his naturalism or atheism, he would never be able to uh, conclude that an, an event from history was a true miracle because it- okay, and then you so you just made the case for us. Yes, that's the thing is so so you you go um, if you if you can get this person to even believe that a miracle happened, then you can go well. You can't even get an atheist on a naturalistic perspective to admit miracles. Yes. So what's the deal? And here's the yeah. problem. If I'm going to rely on a general theism or general miracle, right? And a, God bless the, uh, the great apologetic tool that miracles are. I am not against it. And I don't want to sound like I'm against that. Like, I'm totally not. I'm 100% for miracles as an apologetic. Mm-hmm. I think that they point unequivocally to God. I'm with him on that. But the problem is, if that is my primary position, I'm going to demonstrate the evidence of miracles and the reality that they exist because of the weight of the evidence, because of the preponderance of evidence, all of these miracles, you have to believe. Then you have a serious problem, because then you have to jump back to Scripture, Yeah, and you can't be consistent with it. And so the consistent, even to use that quotation, the consistent atheist is going to say, whoa, 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 wait, wait, how did we get to the Bible? Yeah. So that's not, re- again, that's not reason alone. That is reason plus special revelation, which is not a part of the apologetic. That's right. You're, you, you have stated that we can reason to the triune God of scripture without special revelation. We should do it by what we see out here alone. You don't need Yes. It. But don't, so you, you can't use special revelation whenever you discuss miracles. But then again, I don't even know by without special revelation, I don't, who do I know who Jesus is? Do I have to go to Eusebius? Why do I, why do I get to use this? Oh, do I just treat it as just a historical document? I'm not going to do that with script with, with the scriptures, not with God's word. I'm not going to treat the, I'm not going to treat it like that. Yeah. So, you know, where do I go to know who Jesus is without special revelation? That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, you can treat the Bible as, again. So this is, is it God honoring? And I've asked that question. Is it God honoring to put him in the dock for one? Is it God honoring just to treat his word as, you know, frivolous for a little bit to hopefully expect that the person ends up not treating it frivolous? Hmm. Because in order to be a miracle, there would have to be a God who is the cause of that event. So as a matter of principle, we would insist that a person has to that know that is, well, if you can get somebody to think something is a miracle, um, they can just go, well, there might be something to explain that. They'll, so you're, you're talking to an, a rebellious person that's going to use the intellect that God gave them to figure out ways around worshiping that God that they hate. And so they come up with rescuing devices. We see it all the time. We see it in the evolution debate where yes. there's always like, well, you know, um, yeah, we have this uh, dinosaur bone that has soft tissue. Uh, it just must've been encased differently than our norm. It's, it's the exception to the rule. And so we're just going to keep on believing what we believe um, until we, fi- and we'll figure out why it has soft tissue. Right. Right on. And so you haven't convinced them. Why? Because they don't want what you believe to be true. Yes. Again. So uh, <laughs> you, you can't reason with an unreasonable person. Has to know that God exists before they could even be open to the possibility that an event from history like the resurrection but of Jesus that's was the even problem. possible. That's the problem. He says they have to be open for God for a God to exist in order to be open to the possibility of the resurrection. Okay. When you win someone to general theism, you have won them to an idol. Yes. That's the problem. 
You have won them to a generic God that can do anything. You've won them to the flying spaghetti monster. I'm not trying to be dismissive in that, but that's the problem. Oh, I believe that a general God exists, but then what do you do? The next thing you do is you go to scripture, right? I mean, William Lane Craig has straight up said, I'm not here in this debate to prove that the God of scripture exists. I have a real problem with that. No, no, no. I would make a distinction between William Lane Craig because he is like complete evidentialism Mm -hmm. to where, you know, Richard Howe is not William Lane Craig. Yeah. So I I will give him like he is so Richard is so more close to us. And and, and, and I'd say this too. And and I hope that this is well taken because I do believe that it is true. I think both these guys are always trying to win people to the triune God of scripture. Even by the mechanism that they're using of classical apologetics, their goal is always the triune God of Scripture. When someone like Dr. Craig has said that in a public debate, I have a very serious problem yeah, with that. Yeah. I do believe that he is a Christian 100%. I do believe that he wants people to come to the triune God of Scripture. But they're taking a step out of it. That's the problem. My big piece is again and again. Can you show me from Scripture anytime someone needed to be one to general theism? Because as Paul stands on the hill in Athens in Acts 17, those folks believed in a generalized God, and it or was wrong. Many gods or, or yeah, and it just, was wrong. Yeah. And he was pointing them to the triune God of Scripture. You might say, well, what about the person who doesn't believe in any God at all? I don't think that person exists. Yeah. Why? The Bible. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, we'll we'll get to that 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 problem um, up ahead. Possible. So now the evidentialist is more or less going to say, well, it doesn't really matter. We can kind of mix all these questions together: God, resurrection, and these kind of things. So it, for us, it's a principle debate. Even if practically speaking, people sometimes aren't consistent, and they may jump from some uh, some point to some conclusion inconsistently, so to speak. With respect, however, to how we see ourselves vis-a-vis presuppositionalism in particular, I think a fair way to say it is that we we give viability and credibility to the whole notion of natural theology. That human beings have faculties that we believe God has created us with that enable us to know certain aspects of reality, primarily and initially the physical world around us. And from those, in effect, undeniable truths, uh, we can demonstrate, and const- or rather construct and demonstrate the existence of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, G- and Jacob. And the, God- the problem is they're not undeniable truths. Yeah. And natural theology, and I would tell you, in my, again, my position and understanding of Scripture, men are in the flesh. They cannot reason in spiritual things. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, they don't know how to do that. There is nothing in them that gives them that ability aside from the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, I felt like when we jumped to the fact that the Holy Spirit was the one who is sovereign in salvation, that that, and maybe I misread it, But that was kind of, oh, that's your escape mechanism. No, not at all. That is the primary means. Apologetics works because God sovereignly chooses to use the Holy Spirit. He does it in classical apologetics, just like he does in presuppositional. Yeah, so so the issue is not, um, you know, God does use means. And so I think that came up like... They, it sounded like they took us like, we shouldn't do apologetics. And it's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. God does use means. God does use the defense of the faith to get to the get the gospel to somebody, for one. And I think it's better served in our position than, than uh, uh, evidentialism or classicalism. Yeah, and, um, and, and I would say just both because, of those just means because the result, have won people to Christ. Yeah, and so here's the problem is, is like you're looking at the result and then the— the result justifies the means, but you're not looking at the means. Is the means correct? And that's actually where the debate yes. rests. Yes, is that is exactly. Correct? And again, we say the means so, of classicalism is not correct because it puts God in the dock. It puts his word into question. And what was the first sin was putting God's word into question. And so how can we have a biblical um, apologetic that goes, that's, this is true whether you believe it or not, and how can I demonstrate it to you? I can't directly demonstrate it to you, but I can indirectly demonstrate here's, it to you. Here's the key. Like, no joke, 100%. You go to a classical apologist. How should we do church? Well, what does it say in Scripture? There's a scripturally der- derived ecclesiology. Excellent. How should we do worship? There's a scripturally 
demonstrated function to what worship is. How should we know how to do the Lord's Supper? There's a scripturally evident mechanism by which you should administer the Lord's Supper. How about baptism? You bet. Even though we might have some disagreements, it's still there. How do we deal with problems in the church? There's a scripturally derived mechanism for knowing how to do that. How should we respond to government? There's a scripturally derived mechanism by which we should do that. Okay. How do we do apologetics? Well, we got to talk about natural theology. We're not going to talk about special revelation. Well, scripture doesn't tell us. Mm. Really? Really? Scripture does not show us how to defend the faith. Scripture doesn't show us how we're supposed to respond to charges against the gospel. Am I reading that right? Is that, like, I don't want to misrepresent. Before I jump here to Scripture, is that what you heard, or am I being silly in that? Like, well, I mean, just the approach is we're trying to not use this. First, we can't use this until we establish something from out here first. Philippians 1.16, Dr. Geisler's favorite verse. I am put here for the defense of the gospel. What does he use? Every time Paul got up and defended the gospel, how did he do it? I have done, I've done he the generic know, criticism. Yeah, and, and he doesn't go, well, we need, you know, here's a causal chain of uh, and I'll, creation. You know what, I'll send you that go, article yeah, be, yeah. so you can post it to the website. We can yeah, share it because I think it's a that. great piece. Mm-hmm. So why, when we come to apologetics, do we not use a systematic approach to understanding how to do it? Especially as ones and that have then, been enlightened by the Holy Spirit so, to have the scripture to be able to tell but us. Then the critique is that's not how we derive our hermeneutic. And I'd say we look at how the early church preached. Again, and here's, how the, Jesus here's that circle. Preached, though. We get our hermeneutics from reality, yet this interprets no, what we, reality is, but we can't use this, but so that's the problem. And it creates a cir- circle. We get our hermeneutic from Scripture because we're guided by the Holy Spirit in all truth. Notice that the that we have no recorded sermons of the disciples until after Pentecost. Follow me on this argument. Yeah. Jesus promised, I'll guide you in all truth. No recorded sermons. Now, did they have gospel conversations? Yes. Certainly. Obviously. But they were given an authority and an ability to rightly understand Scripture. Look to the Emmaus Road, Acts or Luke 24. Mm-hmm. He opened their eyes to understand Scripture. We can see the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew goes back and he looks at how all of the Scripture points to Jesus. He couldn't see that until the Holy Spirit guided them in all truth. Yeah. So, where do we get our hermeneutic? Scripture. What do you mean? How can we read? How do we know that we're reading it right? Well, here's the thing. As we read it, we'll be corrected again, as well in how to do it correctly. Sanctification. Exactly. So, again, we get our hermeneutic from reality, and we would say, yes, you get your hermeneutic from reality. But who gets to interpret that reality? Do you get to interpret it autonomously? And I know that they don't like that distinction that we make, but it has to be. And I think um, I shared a, a, a quote from uh, Scott Oliphant today on our website or on our Facebook page, but you know, everything that God does is covenantal. And if we think that there's nothing covenantal, you know, if there, then their God isn't present and there's where your neutral spot is. And then you're not even accountable for it anyway. So why would you defend it <laughs> for one? If you're not accountable, if these people aren't accountable for it, you're, you're defending accountable things, but they're, is that covenantal thing. And this is, this is why it is so uh, different between us because we're, yes. ha- we have at the basis, different theology. Yes. God is a covenantal God and that's how we know him. That, so that's how we know what reality is because we have yes. covenantal documents where we know, we don't know everything, 
But there are truths here that we know for and, certain. And I hope I'm not talking past or yeah. abusing or misrepresenting or besmirching. But the crux of the issue is, and the question is, why now change your decision on how to defend the faith? Which again, here's the key piece. For the covenantal apologist, apologetics and evangelism are two sides of the same coin. Yeah. That's not the same. That is not the same when it comes to, at least in my reading and my understanding of classical apologetics. Because you're not always pointing to the gospel. Yeah. You're just trying to get somebody to agree with you for a second and, and hold their attention. That's just an attention holder. But the thing is, is we need to get them the gospel. So how, 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 what kind of, what, how, in my conversation, how, you know, we got to look, okay, how am I going to get this person um, the gospel? How, what part of what, what their unbelief is that I can share, um, I guess, since making belief. Because they're they're looking at something, they're holding something arbitrary against God. They're going, Grab like, your, this right here is what keeps me from believing God. And I'm like, well, for one, that's not true. You don't want God to begin with. And this is what you've come up with as your rescuing device. <laughs> you know, this is your, this is what you're just trying. You're, you're trying to blame this instead of yourself. You're, we're always trying to make the blame outside ourselves. Um, but that's the thing is we are created in the image of God. We are part of creation. So we, we ourselves speak to the glory of God. We, since we're image bearers, we know that God exists and we're trying to suppress even that about ourselves. That's why Paul goes into the image bearing and design idea of homosexuality and all that stuff, because like those societies end up trying to get rid of every bit of the image of God and remove that from them. They can't get away from it though which is another thing at issue. You got something more to say before I, I was going to tell you to grab your, uh, to grab your institutes off the oh, shelf, yeah. but I've got it right here and, and that's fine. Um, I'm pulling it up on CCLI um, because like, there it is. Boom. There we go. Institutes first book. So here's the deal. One of the things that those who are in the classical tradition, and I've read it more than once, they've continued to say, well, the covenantal apologetic, it's just a recent new development. False. Synthesized and articulated, obviously, it was done most effectively by Van Til. But you cannot just straight up call Calvin a classical apologist. It's very, very clear. First line, you know yeah. the line. Yep. Our wisdom, insofar as it ought to be deemed true and solid wisdom, consists almost entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. But as these are considered together by many ties, it is not easy to determine which of the two proceeds and which gives birth to the other. So say what yeah. you want and say, well, I don't want to, my wife gets on to me because I do voices and I do probably sound really like a jerk when I do that. So I got to be careful. It was my old uh, theater stuff coming out. So you can say, well, the covenantal approach didn't, didn't exist until Van Til. False. We've both read the Institutes. Others who are smarter than us have read the Institutes and appealed to the reality that certainly we don't agree that Calvin is always consistent. Um, we don't because... We've read his chapter on baptism and we reject it. Like yeah. I actually feel really good about his chapter on the Lord's Supper. Disagree with him on baptism. Yeah. Inconsistent in the way he applied the covenantal methodology. And what was the difference? What's the difference there though? It's tradition. That's because why he was still pedo Baptist. I'd agree. Among all the yeah. other awesome things. And Others so have why noted that too. Why but... classical apologetics? Tradition. And then this is what Van Til set out to do is to point out that tradition. Yes. Though, so it's, it's something again, and do so in eternal, a, yeah, if something it, is eternally true, like I've said in the past is it'll fly through history. Yes. There'll be a ghost of it. And there is the presuppositional ghost in Calvin though. It was, they had other issues to deal with in 1535. 
They had so much more to deal with <laughs> than the defense of the faith and the way the methodology. But they were doing it while they were going against Rome. So there was a lot more fish to fry, and so we we just get to have fun tweaking as 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 a uh, and and the argument and isn't that yeah, oh but, hey the the apostles did the covenantal method and then it just disappeared. No. Look, if you want to proof text all the way through things, go right ahead and you can find certainly times where people were being inconsistent in their application. But their question wasn't, what does scripture say about defending the faith? Van Til asked the question. We continue to ask the question. Like, I'm shocked. Like, literally, I am shocked. I've never found another person who did a generic analysis of all the sermons in the book of Acts to see what the continual themes were. I've done it. It will be on our, I'm, I'm going to sit, I'm going to give it to Adam before I leave tonight and we'll get it posted. I challenge anyone to use a generic analysis methodology to test the sermons of the book of Acts and demonstrate that the classical method is what they used. You cannot do it. I, I can tell you, I've done the research. I am a yeah. trained rhetorical theorist. Like my, ma- my bachelor's degree is in rhetoric and public discourse. My master's degree is in research methodology. I've done the work on this. I'm not saying that to sound like an arrogant person or pull out some academic card, but the reality is we can see what they did. Why someone didn't do something like that before, I don't know. Why? I mean, I think Van Til pretty much does it. I don't yeah. know that he applies the lens as particular as I do. And look, you can actually read. You'll be able to see. When we post this, you can read every single one of my uh, academic sources on rhetorical theory and on generic analysis. I want to see someone do that and come to a different conclusion. They're not going to. The data speaks for itself, and in this, Scripture speaks for itself. Yeah. Yep. Move on. Hope I didn't just like go on some type of a crazy rant there, but but, yeah. And the God who incarnated in Jesus Christ, Uh, and so and so we would just we would just deny the the uh, the assertion that it's the presupposition of God that is has to be in place before we could have uh, knowledge. We can have knowledge even in the denial of God because there are some things about reality. That's because you are already presupposing God and unconsciously or or consciously and suppressing it. So that's not what we're saying. This is a straw man. Yes. And so what we're saying is an argumentation. There has if God is not presupposed, then it's going to be absurd. And we are going to show you the absurdity of the worldview you're trying to make for yourself without like you're trying to it's basically you're everybody's building their own intellectual tower of Babel and we're there to help crush it. Yes. And so everything does presuppose God and you admit it and you, and you understand that part, you believe that part, but what you're failing to see in our, in our methodology, I guess is like they are already presupposing God that like they're whenever we hand them logic and they're being logical, we need to say, stop acting like a Christian. Yes. Because everything that they're doing is presupposing God. They're sitting in God's lap and slapping him in the face. So well said. So, I mean, well, that's Greg Bonson. Yeah. It wasn't me. So, <laughs> I know, know I've read it too. Yeah. So, but that, that's, that's what it is. And so we just need to point that out to them. And I understand that we also get in this idea because since, you know, since we're Calvinists, we get all the time. Why evangelize? We got that from them saying, well, if this is the case, then presuppositional and fails to do what it has, what's the goal to do. And it's like, no, 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 not at all. We demonstrate it doesn't mean we're successful. Presuppositionalism does not get success in results. Mm. It gets success in being faithful yes. to the God of the apologetic. Yes. That's, so we have two different well, goals. Our goal is to be faithful. God we, there's, there's the water, there's the seed planter, there's the waterer, but who provides the growth? Where do you and get your methodology it. from? From philosophy or from scripture? Yeah. That's the problem. And the thing is, is my scripture, my theology is my philosophy. And I'm not against studying philosophy, by the way. Yeah. I don't want to well, sound say, like no, that. Philosophy is really good because we can see what man tries to do. Hmm. And so whenever we think about where... He says he's Aristotelian. So it's really interesting whenever they're mad that 
our apologetic comes from Kant. That's where it has its origin. That's what they that's what Adam Tucker said. And I'm like, well, why are you saying Aristotle? Is that where you find your origin? Or you find your origin in uh, Thomas Aquinas, which borrows from Aristotle? You're 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 not saying anything there. You're mad about it going to Kant. Why you why aren't you mad about going to Aristotle? Why is Aristotle so cool? Um, but what was Paul speaking into whenever he said, don't worry about those uh, man's traditions and those philosophies. Don't subscribe to them. Who was around? Yeah. Plato was BC. Aristotle was a student and then didn't like, Pla didn't like Plato's stuff, didn't subscribe to it, started his own school. Um, what was Actually, around at Aristotle, the time? Aristotle, yeah. Plato, Socrates. I think it was before this. No, Socrates first. Socrates. Yes, right. Socrates. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so, thank you. So thank you. you. I this, really yeah, should fine. know that. Yeah. <laughs> so you had this line, and these people are around, and then uh, creates the Western sort of culture that's starting around in that time period, where you get the Hellenism and all that kind of stuff. There. Yeah. What was Paul? What was Paul speaking against? What were the pagans utilizing in Athens? Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. So we have a transcendent philosophy now we do believe that there will be hints of truth in all things and so there is truth that uh, Immanuel Kant got and so the presuppositionalist recognizes that Kant was pretty darn close that without God you, you're stuck inside your head and everything's subjective and relative and you can't know reality but that's where the Christian has the answer you can know reality you can know what's without you because God has told you. So we have a transcend. So it doesn't have its complete origin in Kant. Um, it's just taking biblical truths and seeing what people have done out there. We can look at Aristotle and, and actually by this standard say where Aristotle was right. We can look at here and say, where's Plato right? We can look at here and say, where's Socrates right? But where are they wrong? Hmm. And then we can utilize these things that, somebody might be doing in rebellion against God and we can, we can ut utilize their intellects that they have or stand on the backs of giants and then progress with the standard of scripture. Man, I was so hoping I saw that I got a friend request. I was so hoping, or a, yeah, a friend added me. Well, it was oh. a request. I was really hoping it was Russ Dean because I invited <laughs> him to be my friend. Oh, sweet. Yeah. I don't think he's going to. You should invite him, too, because he won't will. know who you are. I will. Because we'll, you we'll, hadn't sent him messages yet. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll post an invitation for a debate. Yeah. Reality that we can't fail to know. And we think that, ultimately, because we know God has created us that way, even if the atheist doesn't. Even if he doesn't even see that it's God who made him, he, the atheist still cannot fail, if, his, if he's not blind, to see that the sun is shining, for example. And again, we'd have to Agreed. say, this is a straw man, because you know, if, if you don't believe that presuppositionalism agrees with that then that's a problem because no and, and i straight up said that yeah. in fact i think yeah. uh i but love this is, and, this and is where they stopped it. us and said well that's classical apologetics and it's like no we still haven't dealt with the distinction right. and, and so i think that was in the debate that i said well you can know your one two threes and your abcs and tie your shoe uh, I think that was my direct quote. Maybe and that's I, why they, okay. I, I think I, I might be wrong. I yeah. might be wrong. I, I think I know that I said something like that. And that might be where he, he got out the title with the cool, yeah. which, is, which is cool. That was, we agree completely. Um, yeah, you can certainly do all kinds of things in the flesh. Yeah. Spiritual things. But do you, but on your worldview, do you know them? True spiritual things. What you have set up to suppress the truth that you know. Yes. How can you justify that you and, know. and the, well, then the critique of that is, well, why do you need to justify knowledge? Why do you need to justify knowledge? Because you have to demonstrate that you're not an absurdity. Yeah. That's the problem. You have to, every time in a debate or a discussion, every time you make an assertion, you're doing so based upon the claims of a ultimate authority. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You're standing on something. But the real question is, can what you're standing on hold you is up? It, is it, well, is it a figment of your imagination that you're standing on? That's the quicksand I, quotient idea. Yes. You, you show them that they're really not standing on anything at all, really. Yes. 
So I think that's where the, the, the rub comes, and then we can get into the weeds on some of those as we go along. Sure. Uh, thank you uh, all for that. Uh, so let me um, actually let me change my uh, camera angle here a little bit. Just saw that was kind of messed up there. There we go. Mr. Tucker, Adam, yes. uh, I, I, I would probably confuse if I say Adam. So uh, <laughs> I, or my friend, Adam uh, Tucker. But if I refer to you as Mr. Tucker, it's only to designate a difference and, and uh, <laughs> to be un, un, uncordial. Um, I'm curious, you know, obviously you're kind of uh, moderating hosting. I'd love to hear a little bit from you as well. I think that that would be an effective thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, not that I'm not really glad to hear from Dr. Howe, but I'd love to hear, <laughs> hear you take it too. I think it's, it, we'd all like to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So again, just for context sake, uh, you know, this is uh, for our audience. This is not a debate. This is not a formal sort of dialogue. This is just a free flow uh, conversation among four brothers, really. So uh, there's not a moderator. Uh, I'm running the live stream. So I, by default, have to serve as the host. Uh, so, but Dr. Howe and I obviously share uh, very similar uh, thoughts on these issues. And I've, I've learned uh, most everything I claim to sort of kind of almost know uh, from him and uh, from his colleagues at, at SES. So uh, I, I do agree. I think uh, I'll just elaborate on one thing Dr. Howe said. Um, First of all, I appreciate what R.C. Sproul and, and others have said, uh, that the heart can't embrace what the mind doesn't think is true. Uh, and so I do think it's important that we uh, talk to people as human beings, uh, understanding yeah, that but See, that would be my real problem. Yeah. Regeneration isn't just a heart issue. Yeah. That's, that, to me, I think that that's a false dichotomy. Um, I don't think that I said that when we responded. So, yeah, and I mean, like, so the heart, I mean, we, we're hitting a, uh, a verbal meme here. Yeah, but um, the heart can't embrace what the mind doesn't believe it's true. But it's the heart that needs to be changed so that their mind can be renewed. I that's a meme and a poem. Boom! You it just, just came it, off right out of my head there. Yeah, Man. I don't like it. But make, anyway, but that make but that's sure the you problem. record that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I hit the record button earlier. I'm good yeah, and that. I didn't but, tell you to. <laughs> but yeah, the, yeah. So the heart needs to be changed. That's the mm. problem. That is the exact difference in yeah. our understanding the difference in of our theology their heart is wrong and that's why they think we have a problem of ontology and epistemology and how we conflate them um, but the epistemology how you know things and all like it's 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 all connected and this is this is comes from that multifaceted or multi perspectival issue as how things play with one another that we can't look at parts and pieces just by themselves and that's yeah. what i think classicalism does Yes, I, I think you're right on that. Does, I think that's that why it's correct seems so arbitrary. Um, you've got to w see how things play together. And, and let me say this, and I think it needs to be well said. There is no lack of respect for those who are classical apologists here in this room. Again, it's tradition, and I, I, I totally I will get it. critique what I think that is done that is really bad, um, and I think I've, I've noted that a few times. But I do believe someone can be one to the gospel through the use of classical apologetics. I just don't think it's consistent. Yeah. Well, again, it's not. And that's one, why I won't use yeah, it. It's a, it's a means used, but then again, it's not the thing that makes it happen. And we both Pe and we, People use altar yeah. calls. Yeah. That's not in scripture. Yeah. People have come to salvation through altar calls. So is it okay, you know, to if we're going to go with this line of reasoning, is it okay to just give somebody Buddhism as long as they end up with the triune God afterwards? No, no, you don't do that. Yeah. And so I'm not saying that classical apologetics is as bad as giving somebody Buddhism. So don't hear me wrong on that. Whole but different category just, than yeah. Rustine. <laughs> but at the same time, if God uses bad things, then why are we even having this debate? Why are we even having this debate? Well, because there is an extra grind because they believe that what we are doing has to be wrong yes. or else we're stuck in relativism and what they're doing is okay. If, if God just uses means, then why are we having this discussion? Yeah. Are they mad at the presuppositionalist because we're coming at them saying what they're doing and, is wrong? And, and what or do I, they believe again, what, what we're doing is wrong? And so if, again, if this is just, if God just uses means bad or good to do what he wants, then this discussion doesn't even need to happen. Yeah. But the question comes again from me. Yeah. Correct me. According to scripture, Titus chapter one, verse nine Speaking of what the function of the pastor elder is, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and rebuke those who contradict. Okay. Paul's being pretty clear here that he's talking about the, the scripture, right? Yeah. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 
3, verse 16, um, Scripture is useful for correcting. Mm -hmm. Paul saying very clearly in 1 Corinthians that what he's writing is a command from God. Jude, verse 3, very clearly the idea is you correct people according to what Scripture says. So my issue is, Scripture then must be the standard. Now they're going to say, I agree. My problem is the inconsistency with the methodology since I can't find it in the yeah. text of Scripture. Yeah, if it's the standard and I've looked. That, yeah, and if I've looked. And if Scripture is the standard that uh, you had to repent and walk in, then why can't you challenge the one that needs to repent to walk in the standard with the standard? Yes. Yes, yes, cut yes. Half, cut half of the battle out and just go, this is what I believe and I will defend the hope that lies within me. Not been to you. Like, it's not about you. You're asking me the questions and I'm going to go play defense with the offense from the only thing that can make any of what this person is doing intelligible. Yes. And then hold them and let God be the judge of them instead of them being the judge of God. Right on. So I think that's a good stopping point. Yeah, for today. it's good, man. And I was, I was actually, got, th I think that we was got fun. a few extra minutes in. <laughs> so let's make sure next time, just so we all know what we're going to do next time. We will probably do two shows next week. And then we might not have a, a live show for a week or two after that, probably. Um, well, I probably won't be in studio for one of those. Um, but we're going to hopefully have Andrea DiLorenzo on to yeah. talk a little bit about Plandemic and the worldview that underlies it. We'll also deal with Mr. Tucker's article. Hopefully, not only will we deal with it spoken, uh, I will also, hopefully, we'll have some type of a written response to it as well, which I think is well which is an easy piece for Adam and I to do together. Yeah. Uh, and then we will continue to work through this debate. Yeah. Sound good. Awesome. Love I just it. made all those plans for us right yeah. here. So, <laughs> well, thank you guys uh, for uh, being a part of the tag. You're it podcast live. And for you guys that download this podcast, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We hope that uh, you've enjoyed this thing being on Podbean and all that kind of stuff too. So that's been an awesome move and yeah. I'm still enjoying that as well. So, um, but yeah, Me thank too. you guys and God bless you guys and may he keep you guys and may his face shine upon you. So that, with that well, said, number, well, number six, huh? Yeah. 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 So with that said, this is the Tag Your Podcast. I'm Ray, Ray. And I am Dave. And Dave. 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 Dave.